Welcome everyone to our community forum this evening, Building a Resilient Met Howe. My name is Joshua Porter. I work as a climate program manager with the Met Howe Valley Citizens Council and serve on the planning team of the Climate Task Force. I'm happy to be helping host this evening's program from the Upper Twist River. In the summer of 2019, the Met Howe Valley Citizens Council initiated a community process for developing a climate action plan and engaged over 40 community members representing nonprofits, agencies, businesses, and local government. Over 350 community members met in the Twist Community Center just over a year ago, and the task force has been working committedly since. We, of course, have had to slow our process and adapt to the pandemic to continue the work through those months. Tonight is our opportunity to share with you the progress the task force has made on the plan, as well as share our next steps in ways you can get involved. Next slide, please. Before we dive in, I'd like to orient you to our webinar format, especially for anyone new to Zoom. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a menu bar which includes multiple buttons. You can see one labeled chat, and this will be your avenue for sharing comments throughout the program. You can also use this chat feature to let us know if you are having any technical issues. To get you interacting with this feature and each other, go ahead and click on the chat box and type in one climate solution that you would love to see happen in the Met Howe Valley. Share whatever comes to mind and we can see what each other are thinking about already. You can also see a button labeled Q&A. This is where we will collect questions throughout the program and then address as many as possible during the question and answer session after the presentations. If you're having any trouble seeing a presenter or the slides, you can try adjusting your view by clicking on the small box labeled view in the upper right corner of your screen. We'll also be running a few polls throughout the evening to gather input from you. We'll start with our first one now to see where folks are calling in from tonight. Okay, it's up now. So simply click on the, the town closest to you. Numbers are climbing. Great, and looks like we, we have our results and we see we've got, we've got some, ooh, yeah, it looks like Winthrop, Winthrop takes it for representation. And it also helps us see where we're gonna continue to do more outreach. Thanks for participating in that. Okay, I also wanna mention that we'll send a brief webinar survey after the program. And if you fill that out, you'll be entered to win a $15 gift certificate for delicious Blue Star coffee. Next slide, slide please. So let's take a brief look at our agenda this evening. First, we will hear why this climate action is needed. Hearing from Amelia Marchand of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, from our mayors of Pateros, Twisp and Winthrop, and from two of our local youth climate leaders. Then we will dive into the background and process for creating a Metho Valley Climate Action Plan, review climate impacts, share recommended climate actions, and hear from a community panel of task force members. Following that, we will share ways that you can participate in and contribute to the next stages of the plan's development and what implementation of the plan looks like. As part of that, we will be hearing from Tom Donnelly from the Federal Emergency Management Agency about the partnership that FEMA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco have teamed up on to help communities adapt to climate change. After that, we will hold a question and answer session with all of our panelists from the evening. Okay, please unshare the presentation screen. So to begin our program this evening, we want to acknowledge that this climate action plan is for the lands and water in the entire Met Howe Valley, which are all part of cultural landscapes as traditional lands that have been stewarded since time immemorial by the Met Howe people. Indigenous people worldwide are responsible for the continued stewardship of over 80% of the existing land-based biodiversity on earth, which was supported in a talk on the urgency of climate change this past week by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres speaking to the importance of indigenous knowledge. 
Such deep relationships and responsibility through the generations is what is needed, especially at this time of seeking climate solutions. Moving beyond acknowledgement, we can each respect tribal sovereignty, support truth and reconciliation efforts, and most importantly, build relationships based on reciprocity. It is an honor now to introduce Amelia Marchand, the director of the Environmental Trust for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, speaking about where values align in our climate work and what is important to her and her work in the Environmental Trust program. Amelia and the Environmental Trust are already thinking about and taking action on many of the things we are talking about here tonight. And we are grateful for the interest in supporting each other's efforts in this work. Welcome, Amelia. So this isn't Amelia, but this is Jasmine Minbashian. <laughs> Representing Amelia, she's wrote me to let me know that she lost internet service about 30 minutes ago and her cell service is very poor where she lives. So these are some of the challenges of working and organizing in um, rural places, which I'm sure we're gonna touch on later. But she wanted me to convey the three points she planned on addressing tonight from her perspective as the director of the Environmental Trust Program for the Colville Tribe. And I'm just gonna read them to you here. Um, one, she wanted to encourage the role of local government to engage in climate adaptation and mitigation Two, she wanted to focus efforts on holistic integrated approaches that are risk averse and equitable to all sectors of society. And three, identify opportunities that will support long-term intergenerational justice. And she apologizes that she's having internet trouble and looking forward to partnering with our efforts here in the Metau watershed. Thank you for relaying those messages, Jasmine. I really appreciate those. Okay, so I think we'll we'll move on then to the mayoral panel for this evening. So, so we are we are fortunate to have the strong town leadership that we have in the Matt Howe here with us tonight. Uh, is Mayor of Pateros, Carlene Anders, Mayor of Winthrop, Sally Ranzo, and Mayor of Twisp, Suing Moody, to speak to us about why the Matt Howe Valley needs a climate action plan. So welcome, mayors. Good evening, Joshua. Thank you. Uh, this is Carlene, mm -hmm. and uh, it's exciting to be here tonight after uh, a year or more of uh, continually working on this project. And uh, uh, I know that uh, there's been so many different people involved and the urgency around um, addressing some of these issues right now is, uh, we've gone through three, three years out of six of these firestorms and had major, major impacts. And it is time that uh, people are excited and, and participating and um, wanting to make a difference in their lives long term uh, through, um, through adaptation, mitigation, preparedness, all these pieces, particularly around the wildfire smoke um, and just the environment in general. And so um, I'm really excited again about, uh, about getting to participate in this and hope that uh, we will be able to implement some of these pieces in the plan over time and um, really look forward to community, more community involvement all across the county for this. And uh, I think uh, Sue is next. Okay, thanks, Carlene. I appreciate it. So first of all, I just want to emphasize the the to answer the question, you know, why we're involved. Um, I just want to emphasize the desire for a resilient Medhow is being really at the core of why I think we're all here today. And I really applaud the work that's being done collaboratively on a long-term plan to achieve that goal. It's more important now than ever that everyone be part of this effort collaboratively. Um, there are many reasons why the town of Twist has been involved from the beginning um, in the work of the task force. And I wanna shout out especially a thanks to council member Mark Easton for attending all of the meetings on behalf of myself and the rest of the council and reporting back. 
Um, the climate plan addresses and intersects with many fundamental areas of our daily lives and the quality of life that we hope to see in the future. I guess if I had to name a few reasons um, why the town has participated, I would start with the need um, to continue to ensure, of course, for us, particularly why, um, well, the water issue, as you all know, um, it remains a critical aspect of um, everything for the town, available for our future residents and businesses. And um, having the fact that we have gone through a moratorium um, in the town of Twisp, is definitely uh, critical because we know very well firsthand the impacts of what not having enough water means to our community. Um, it has had a profound impact on uh, affordable housing and other issues. And the fact that unincorporation for a town is potentially real um, without water in planning for our future. Additionally, I have to say, echoing what Carlene said, wildfires, um, is a huge factor. And of course, we've had firsthand experience in this, but also in 2015, we recognize even uh, the de devastation and potentially tragic impacts of ever growing larger and faster moving wildfires that we've seen in the past. And I, I recall myself the anxiety of seeing the fire crest into town after sunset when air attack were no longer available and we had to solely rely on the heroic efforts of the firefighting ground crew to keep the flames from reaching homes within the town. Um, but it's not just the existence of wildfire itself, but also the impact that they have on a physical level to our community's health and well being. The long term impacts of months of unhealthy smoke inhalation for everyone, and most especially for our vulnerable populations, those with health conditions, seniors, and those without the means to escape the toxic situation, um, is very disturbing. Additionally, uh, we all know that disturbances to our natural environment can also have a profound impact on our community's economic well-being. And as in all emergencies, they do come at a high cost and have um, impact on the many levels, but varying degrees to both lives and livelihoods um, in general. But I don't want to end on a negative note. Um, I, want to, I want to share the good news and that we can make choices to be proactive and in the process become more resilient as a community itself. Um, and in doing so, I just want to share a few points um, that TWISP has already systematically begun with the recognition that this work does need to be carried on and shepherded into the future. And so a few key points I just want to say highlights um, of good news, water conservation improvements to prevent leaks and proper metering and rates adjustment have been really key. We have um, obviously gone through the morator moratorium had gone through a situation where we didn't have enough water to the point where we do have some more water now um, available. And that was largely due through a lot of conservation effort, wastewater, and making sure that our treatment plant produces quality water going back into the rivers has been really critical for us as a town. And support of the transit system, as I know the other cities in our, in our, in our county have also supported. And street improvements um, that we've made to connect sidewalks to our neighborhoods um, and thereby um, further enhancing the ability for people to uh, travel without having to get into their vehicles and reducing energy consumption and light pollution by putting in new um, LED lights um, in all of our, uh, our downtown street lights were replaced, protecting our dark skies as well. And then lastly, the main thing I wanna say is the support of partnerships that we have with others in our community that are doing great work. And I'll just mention Methow Recycles as one of them with the metal drives that we work together with and town chipping program. So basically it's a start. We're becoming resilient. It is a choice and it is a choice to be proactive versus reactive. And I guess if I could say, if we're given a choice, I hope we collectively choose to take that choice and be proactive. So thank you all for being here today. And with that, I'd like to pass on to Sally. I'm here somewhere. There I am. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, this is a fantastic opportunity. Thank you so much for having me and allowing us to talk a little bit about Winthrop. Um, my whole idea is that we need to move forward. 
We can't keep talking about ideas. We need to just actually make ideas happen. And when ideas happen, um, then the climate will come along or we will be able to help with some of these different things. So the first thing that we're doing in town is, uh, as you all know, Winthrop is a tourist community. And our biggest challenging is balancing tourism with uh, the residents and the local citizens and trying to keep everybody happy. The tourists, of course, they allow us to have a lot of the little things that we have here. You know, the, uh, the trail system that we have in town, uh, the Susie Stevens Trail, uh, the Riverwalk Trail that's proposed. Um, we have a lot of emphasis on <clears throat> non-motorized transportation. Non-motorized transportation, of course, is going is the most efficient. And it's also going to be the best as far as the environment is concerned. So our focus is on uh, trying to uh, just keep those trails <clears throat> for walking. We're also in the process of purchasing the Meadowlark Park which is the, con uh, the Meadow Conservancy has uh, purchased 142 acres up on the hillside of Studhorse uh, joining town. And the town has received an RCO grant to purchase that land. Um, it'll probably go through in January. Uh, there's three miles of trails up there, which we consider basically a walking trail and a neighborhood trail. We wanna keep it a neighborhood trail. I don't want this one to be advertised for the tourists. I want the people who are walking it now to continue to walk it for as long as they can. That is gonna be a huge asset to our community. And I really wanna thank the Metow Conservancy for all they have done. One of the reasons we have all of the beautiful things that we have here in the Valley for recreation is because of the Metow Conservancy at the Metow Trails Association. Those two organizations are keeping the rest of us um, from being able to get outside. We are able to go places because of them. The Forest Service lands around it and the terrible fires that have been happening in the past years are evident Every time I go for a hike up in the Pesaten or a backpack and you're walking for miles and miles and miles through black sticks and climbing over black logs and it's a huge impact. We can't afford to lose any more of our forest. So anything that we can do in order to help keep those massive fires from going is extremely important. I'm not going to get into some of the details of our progress because I know Rockland Culp is also on this and I think she's going to be talking about some of those too and I don't want to steal some of her thunder. So, but I do want to thank Rockland uh, for all that she does. And uh, she's the reason that we have all the resources and all of the trails that we have right now. So thank you and I'll turn it on to whoever's next unless there are questions. Well, we'll we'll have uh, some time for some questions later, but uh, that, that's a great reminder that uh, as folks get have questions, go ahead and, and type those into the Q and A box, and we'll have those those queued up for for that session. Um, so thank you each for the the actions that you're already taking um, uh, in your in our towns and the importance you are giving this climate action work. We are so grateful for your leadership and it is essential how timely it is. Your message resonates very powerfully just in terms of moving forward, identifying that it, that it is a choice and that we have this opportunity to be proactive. And I think that really frames the, the problem at hand in a very different way that it's, it's not just about climate uh, problems and challenges, it's actually a huge, huge opportunity. And I, I think as we look towards moving into more of a, a green economy, we, we can really see that as an opportunity. So I, I also understand we have uh, some other elected officials that have registered and joined us this evening, including County Commissioner Chris Branch and Representative Keith Gaynor. Thank you for joining us to learn about the, this community-wide effort. And we look forward to working with you to identify 
ways you can support on, on county and, and state levels as well. So next, we will be hearing from Stella Gichos and Maisie Shaw, uh, both juniors at Liberty Bell High School, on behalf of the Liberty Bell Youth Climate Group to express their own perspectives on climate change. It is so important to hear and act upon the views of our young people. I feel strongly that the 1.4 million youth that mobilized themselves across 123 countries for the youth climate strike in March of 2019 demonstrated just how much they aren't simply our next generation of leaders, but they're our leaders today. We understand we're having a little technical difficulty with the sound, just bear with us a moment, we'll, we'll restart it. Hello. Hi, I'm Stella Gichos. I'm a junior at Liberty Bell High School and a leader of the Liberty Bell Youth Climate Action Group. I've lived in the Medhow Valley my entire life. As a young person and a Valley resident, the future of the world is extremely relevant in my mind. And the end of the climate crisis remains a forefront to my generation's to-do list. The Medhow Valley filled with beautiful land, native species and a welcoming community is a place I'm proud to call home. Even throughout the 16 years I've been alive, I've watched the Valley change drastically by the increase of residents, harsh fire seasons, and decreasing amounts of snowfall each winter. With more and more families moving to the valley, farming and ranching, lack of public transportation, and the unavailability of sustainable living, our resources are becoming strained and limited, and eventually the damage will be irreversible. Without deliberate change, we could be losing our chance to fight for this valley. Taking action and pledging our dedication to the mitigation of climate change is absolutely necessary for the future of the Medhow. It is simply not enough to have respect for this valley or even to cherish it. We must fight for it too. We owe it to the native people who originally thrived here. We owe it to the breathtaking scenery, to the countless plants and animals. We owe it to my generation and the next one too. By initiating the Climate Action Plan, we're taking a crucial step in the direction of worldwide mitigation. Action items included in the plan, like adding public transportation and ride sharing to the community and increasing carbon sequestration can help our valley persevere through the threat of climate change. Even small towns can have a big impact. So on behalf of the Metha Valley youth, thank you for showing up and joining the movement and supporting the Climate Action Plan. Hi, I'm Stella Gichos. This tumor is growing, invading the canals of nature, stealing every crevice, claiming every ocean for itself. Soon it will be inoperable. Soon our earth will be so littered with candy wrappers and fossil fuels that the ground is unrecognizable. This sickness cannot be cured by a poem or a recycle bin. The real change is up to us, the young, the old, Republican, Democrat, and everything in between. It's up to us. All right. Well, wow. Thank you, um, Stella and Maisie, for your forceful and moving statement and poem um, you're just reminding of us of how important this effort is and how your future is riding on the actions we take and all of our uh, future generations so um, really appreciate that and appreciate the um, the mayors giving their overview of 
of, of what they're doing and how they see this plan fits in. And uh, a lot of the themes you've mentioned and actually the themes that have been mentioned in the chat function about what we need to do are things that um, have been pinpointed in this plan. So uh, I think we're on a good path here. So I'm um, Mark Dodon. I've been a strategic advisor uh, and a person working on this plan with uh, a planning team that includes Joshua, Sarah Schrock, uh, Drew, and others. And uh, it's my pleasure to present to you an overview of what's in the plan uh, tonight, uh, along with Sarah. And it's going to be a real flyover because there's a lot in this plan. It's also a live uh, living document that we're continually updating and revising as we get input uh, from folks. So what we have today is the sort of a PowerPoint summary that I'm going to present. Um, and we're also going to put in the chat a link to a more detailed a uh, draft of some of the action items that go underneath some of the higher level um, 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 summaries that I'll be providing. So provide in this section overview of the impacts of a changing climate on the Metau. Um, look at our emissions inventory, some work we did as part of this effort. Summarize the values and vision that came out of the planning process and then the outcomes that we're striving to achieve through this plan. Um, I'll then present for each one of those outcome areas, the goals that the uh, process established and then priority actions. There's lots of different actions, but the priority actions that we identified as early ones to get going on now. And then I'll close with uh, what you can do yourselves, uh, both being engaged, but also individually to, um, to address uh, becoming more resilient and reducing emissions. So uh, I think it's been said a, a couple times, some good words here, working collaboratively and being proactive. Um, this is a community-based planning process that has really been driven by uh, the volunteer efforts of members of the Meta Valley community, uh, by um, um, the elected officials that have been involved and their representatives, by experts that are in our community and the people who've contributed their time outside to this effort. So we formed a task force um, originally of about 22, 25 members that then grew over time to over 30 members. And then we formed sector subgroups around different topic areas like natural systems, economic, built environment and infrastructure, uh, water. And each one of those groups looked at what are the issues and the problems, what are the potential solutions, and then what action should we undertake to, um, to address those. Um, we had a workshop a, a year ago in November that Dr. Amy Snover came and presented the uh, best available science from the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group, which she leads. We're fortunate that she is also a Valley resident and so part-time resident. So she contributed her expertise and really gave us um, a very uh, concise and important overview of the impacts. We'll be summarizing those again tonight, but. Over 350 people attended that, uh, that workshop that also then uh, followed on with people looking at what actions they should take and putting down uh, their own ideas and then writing vision statements out of which we have synthesized a lot of that material and processed it to come up with what we're presenting tonight. Um, and then we also commissioned um, Rule Hammerschlag, whose sister lives in this valley, to do a greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which is a pretty standard part of um, a community action plan, but difficult to do actually in a rural area. So we'll look at the results of that and um, see what that says about where our emissions are coming from. So I think I'll turn it over to Sarah right now, who's gonna summarize um, the uh, impacts of a changing climate on the Metau and uh, some of the meanings of that from the standpoint of resiliency. Take it away, Sarah. Thanks, Mark. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. That was mine. <laughs> Can you go back one? Okay, so, um, I mean, this is just going to be a real brief synopsis of some of the um, impacts that we're seeing from climate change and that we can expect to see and um, the implications to our community at, in, and across those different sectors that Mark identified. Um, and, you know, but essentially, I'm going to just give you a quick primer on climate, um, climate process, because um, 
I think most of you are probably well informed on that level, but um, the climate change issue affects all everywhere. It's not just local, it's a global problem. And so um, the scientists have been looking at um, the role of, of greenhouse gases in our environment um, actually since the 1800s. And it was um, hypothesized over 200 years ago that um, the increase in CO2 could actually um, warm the earth. And it was, you know, talked about in very academic circles. And it, then in about the 1950s, um, it became actually pretty well accepted that in fact, um, continuing, you know, the increase in CO2 into the atmosphere would in fact warm the globe. And it's still kind of circled around in the academic world. And it wasn't until probably the 1970s and 1980s where it started to gain a little bit of traction in um, more broad-based science. Um, and then fast forward into um, the 1990s and the 2000s. And by that time, um, it was a global conversation. And in 2015, um, the UN convention, um, the Inter International Panel on Climate Change um, made a determination um, that you know across the globe, scientists agree that um, the burning of fossil fuels will in fact um, warm our climate. And so what does that mean to our human systems? And that's what we're gonna talk about um, at the local level. So you can advance the slide. Um, in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, you can see the emissions um, across time and also in this um, image from NASA. And this slide is just to let you know that this is definitely um, a global a global, global problem, but we this plan is local. Um, 2020 is on track to be the warmest year yet. Um, we had a pretty warm summer, so you know we continue to see those warm summers and that's gonna be, uh, that is one of the predictions that we're gonna continue to see is um, more hot days. So um, you can see in 1950, when they made that first declaration, um, where the CO2 level was and where we are today. So um, again, it's a rapid incline and that has some implications. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. So to begin with, um, we're seeing on average a one and a half degree warmer um, from the beginning of the century. Um, we're seeing that the coldest days of the year are actually almost five degrees warmer. We're seeing the frost-free season, 16 days longer. So our growing season maybe is longer, which might not be necessarily a bad thing depending on where you are. Um, we're seeing um, peak stream flow runoff times changing. And in the Cascades, we're seeing a decrease of 25% um, snowpack. And um, they predict by 2080, we're gonna see um, over less than half of what we have today in snowpack, um, which is fairly substantial for our watershed. Um, and again, the number of large fires across, not just the west, not just the east side of the Cascades, but also the west side. So next slide, please. Um, there's a lot that, that the physical environment and how it's going to respond to the climate. And this is just sort of a synopsis. We are going to see on average, um, the average seasonal temperature and um, daily temperatures rise. So um, that means more number of hot days in the summer and then the average temperature in the winter higher. Um, shoulder seasons will probably be, you know, within those same ranges, but um, we're gonna see more warmer days. Um, so what does that mean for our precipitation? Well, it means that the timing of when we get our precipitation, both rain and snow, is going to shift. And we're going to see faster snow melt in the spring, which means prolonged summer drought. Um, we're, all, we're also going to see lower winter snowpack, and we're going to see more rain and more rain on snow events. And then, um, although there's going to be variability, the intensity, quantity, and duration of rain are expected to rise. And um, so instead of gentle rains that we might get in the spring, we may get more like summer deluges or you know, more um, intense rainfalls with more quantity at a given time. Um, and so those are, those are kind of some of the weather Im impacts that we can expect to see from our physical environment reacting to the warmer temperatures that we have. Um, next slide, please. 
so um, what that means locally um, are, you know, there's a wide range of things that are going to happen. Um, but we are going to see warmer stream temperatures, and that's pretty critical. Uh, water temperature is a limiting factor for our, um, our cold water uh, species in our rivers. Um, we're going to see more water, we're going to see drought, and that means more demand on water. So it's going to impact our water resources quite a bit. Um, we're going to see just um, as the temperatures hotter days, more hotter days, we're going to see um, physical responses in our own bodies and our plant, our plants and animals. Um, the intensity of these storms and um, especially, you know, those downpours that we get after a wildfire in those um, steep slopes, you know, we're, we are potentially going to see more events like washouts and um, flash flooding. We are going to experience um, lots of wildfire impacts, um, including smoke evacuations and um, like we've already seen lots of life and property. And then those wildfires obviously have impacts, tertiary impacts on um, how those natural systems respond. And then our agricultural sector is going to experience um, and is already experiencing crop stress, um, different types of erosion, um, disease, and um, species migration. So next slide, please. So in order to tease out what that means and the implications for our community, this plan broke up into five subsectors and each um, task force subsector identified what they felt like were the leading issues that they wanted to, um, they wanted our solutions to address. So for instance, in the economy sector, that lower snowpack, less snow, more rain is going to have an effect on our winter recreation and our summer tourism is also gonna be changed by um, smoke wildfire impacts. Um, we're gonna see a change in the labor market and housing affordability based on um, the changes in how the economy is reacting. So um, what, we're look, what, we, what this all means and why it's important is that the underlying value to these impacts are our livelihoods. So that's why we care. That's why we care about these impacts, right? Um, in infrastructure, or sometimes we refer to it in this plan as built environment, um, we're gonna see higher costs of living from um, having to fireproof our homes, things like that. Um, we're going to see deeper wells. We're already seeing that in the valley that people have had to go a little bit deeper to find water. Um, we potentially will have to upgrade our water treatment systems due to the warmer water and surface water withdrawals. Um, we're going to look at, we may be stressed from supply chain demand um, issues during um, climate events, climate related natural disasters. We can expect probably higher utility rates as our utility purveyors have to um, be resilient to fires, potentially shut off fires. And that there's a lot of investment that has to go into them being able to react to the natural disasters, as well as invest in more robust um, and resilient infrastructure for the electrification that we'd like to see. So, um, you know, that's, that's an impact on our well-being and our, um, our livelihood. So, um, and then also the destruction from, of, of our physical environment from natural disasters caused by climate. Um, so, you know, the underlying value of all this is our built environment and our human well being. Um, in the center, and of probably why we should really care is that um, all of this affects our mental health, our physical health, and the safety and security of our community. And, um, I think everything of what we're doing is, is leading up to this central value of um, why we, we need to take action. Um, our natural systems are very complex and there's a lot of effects that we're going to and we are already seeing from climate change. And this is just a small list of what our natural system subject sector group has prepared. But um, we're gonna see biodiversity loss, species migration, species life cycle, um, timing changes, um, the effects of fire on our um, biodiversity, uh, water quality issues, debris flows, erosion. And um, those are very dynamic systems that have cascading effects across all things. And, um, and so um, 
inherent in itself, we should care about our natural biodiversity because that's the underpinning of all of these values. And then um, finally, our agriculture sector, um, they are already seeing impacts from climate change and um, weather related events associated with climate change um, from productivity loss from plant stress, disease, um, changing in the bloom time, uh, soil erosion, um, animal stress from heat, loss of pollinators is a big one, um, livestock and animal stress, um, labor stress, meaning farm labor, um, working in hotter conditions is more difficult, um, and then shifting in um, the timing and need for irrigation based on the shifting um, hydrologic regimes. And so again, um, this underlying value of why we care about this is our livelihood and our natural systems. So um, I think that's it for climate implications. All right, thank you, uh, um, Sarah. Now we'll switch to the other side of this. All of those projections are all based on us you know, emissions that keep in the range of the 1.5 degree to two degree temperature rise. And um, you know, we need to at least be at that level and going beyond that level has even more serious implications. So looking at how we reduce our emissions is part of this climate action plan. So as I said, we commissioned um, uh, Rule Hammerslava, who's an expert in doing greenhouse gas emissions, to look at the emissions that we have in the METAL. And there's a lot of um, you know, tricky points about doing an emissions inventory in a rural area. Uh, it's harder to get the data. But this is an interim report that we have that basically shows that our emissions from our community, basically our energy and waste and water and the moving around that we do um, and the energy we consume in our houses is about 82,000 tons per year or nine tons per person, um, our best estimates. And about over 90% of that is from vehicles, so from driving around. So that really points the, the, um, the arrow at what we want to do, what we need to do to reduce those emissions. A little bit from buildings and a little bit from waste and wastewater. Um, the reason why compared to other um, areas, we're low both in per person and per and our focus on vehicles and, and transportation is that our electricity sector is 96% clean um, energy uh, from hydro and a little bit from nuclear. So we benefit from that. Um, and uh, we actually don't count uh, and protocols don't count um, wood burning stoves emissions. Of course, there's emissions that are particular matter, but the the uh, protocols for that that date back to Kyoto and also Washington state law uh, says that those are not really counted as emissions and they're considered to be sequestered at the same rate that they are emitted. So we don't see that here. However, um, beyond those community emissions, mostly from transportation, uh, we can think about what is happening in the region uh, and the landscape that we, um, that we live in and also what is emissions are associated with uh, consumption and all the things we import into the valley and consume. So um, some significant you know, sort of outcome of looking at those numbers uh, from, from the work we've done. The graph, the chart on the left uh, shows uh, the Meta Valley and the change in biomass between 2012 and 2017 using Forest Service and satellite data. And the darker spots are where we've lost biomass and the green spots are where we've uh, gained biomass. The net loss is 2 million metric tons. And we think most of that has come from fire. Not all of that has been emitted into the air right now, but it's gonna ultimately decompose over time. And if you convert that biomass into an average annual emissions equivalent, that's equal to almost 700,000 tons of CO2. So a lot of CO2 relative to the 80,000 tons that we saw for uh, the community itself, but really points again to the need to think of, of forests as a carbon sink and how do we protect those forests and the landscapes in which we um, you know, recreate and live. Um, and just as reference, we have 200 million metric tons of wildfire emissions from uh, the United States, mostly from our West Coast fires so far this year. So these are big numbers that affect um, the overall trajectory of emissions, uh, both globally and nationally. Um, secondly, our consumption related emissions. This is what happens upstream. It's called life cycle emissions associated with production and supply chain, transportation of goods and services that we consume in the Valley. That's a very complicated thing to do in emissions inventory for, uh, for that, but looking at other studies where that's been done, 
it's an estimate that it's either one to one or up to two to one. So our 80,000 emissions would be 160,000 emissions or, or in that range uh, as, a, as an overload to our consumption-based emissions. So we have um, actions in this plan around reducing consumption. So um, that's just a quick snapshot of the emissions and looks at our mitigation side of things. So now I'll just go through the core elements of our plan. I think Sarah did a nice job of thinking of explaining the values we're looking at to, um, to safeguard and, and, and protect and enhance in our plan. And so those values are listed here on the right and they're all connected in a resiliency triangle of you know, going up and going down. Our well-being depends on the health of our natural systems, our livelihoods and vice versa. So we spent a lot of time as a task force and a group thinking about what our values are and how we uh, organize our plan around those values and, uh, and, and think of solutions which uh, address them. Um, the group, um, really based on some of the early words that we received from uh, many of you in the community at that uh, workshop a year ago, crafted a vision statement for where we see um, uh, we wanna end up in this, in this journey and some of the elements of that which you see on the right a resilient metal plans for and successfully responds to our changing climate. Our resilience is measured by the health of our air, water, land, people, and all living things. And then uh, our goal is to be cohesive and prepared and promote equity be by addressing you know, the elements on the right-hand side, which we're gonna dive into going forward. Uh, and then the lower left is just the word cloud that came out of the words uh, that were uh, written up in the workshop a year ago. So um, this is our, our vision statement. We invite you to comment on it. Again, it's a living document and we're continuing to refine this, but this is our sense of what we wanna shoot for. Um, related to that, um, our uh, planning team and the task force identified uh, seven outcomes that, that we organized our actions and goals um, and solutions around. And those addressed go back to the impacts and to the idea of reducing emissions. Abundant water to sustain nature and people, a resilient, healthy, and abundant natural systems, a safe, prepared community in the face of adversity, um, a low carbon, efficient, livable, and resilient built environment, a thriving economy with equity for all. Equity is again, an important piece of this, a vibrant future for our agriculture and a carbon neutral metal. So we're moving forward uh, we're trying to be proactive and work collaboratively to achieve these outcomes and the plan is built around that. Uh, many different types of, of goals and actions and scales of actions that are incorporated into the plan. And again, there's a link to download the more detailed uh, document which shows uh, more of these uh, actions from stewardship to education, behavior change, actions at the individual to the, to the uh, regional, state and national level where we can use our advocacy voice to make a difference there. And then what should be our priority near-term actions or ongoing and longer-term actions? And how do we think big about preparing for the changes that we see are coming down the road? Uh, so those are all embedded in this uh, plan. As I said earlier, we're really focused on an equity element to this. And the definition the group came up with was equity is for us providing added support to disadvantaged groups or vulnerable populations so that everyone experiences the benefits from our actions and we're not leaving people behind as we make uh, this transition and become more resilient. And so that requires special attention to the vulnerable uh, folks in our community um, and to reduce those disparities that we face. And all of this is in the context of multiple benefits. A lot of things we do to address climate uh, and those issues uh, provide multiple benefits for the community. So um, I will, again, in a very quick way, go through for each one of those outcomes, what is the um, uh, kind of the outcome statement, which is on the left here, what goals or, or a summary of actions did we uh, define through this process? Again, this is the task force and the subgroups working diligently over the last year and a half or so to come up with this. And then actions that have come out of our most recent discussion of what are uh, sort of should be priority actions based on uh, the timeliness of them, the foundational element of them, the uh, importance of them to having impact on the issues and challenges we face. So 
water is, of course, the lifeblood of our economy and our agriculture and of the Meta Valley, and it's been a big issue for as long as we've all been in the Meta Valley. Our goal here is to manage the finite water resources to meet the needs of our community and natural systems now and in the future. Um, you know, pretty basic solid goal, but we prepare for and adapt to changing water regimes. So we recognize they're coming. Uh, we defined five, uh, that's right, five different goals in this process. And then out of that came 19 specific actions, uh, which are in the more detailed plan. And then we, again, identified some of these to be uh, some of our more important uh, or uh, more essential actions to move on. Not that anything is less important than anything else, but some things, as I said, are more timely and, and appropriate to act on first. So um, Mayor Sue mentioned uh, the issue of having enough water for the town. So that's up there as an important action as well as retaining water rights in the valley. Uh, we've seen uh, people try to take water out of the valley and obviously if we lose the water, and we need to really preserve and use that water well in the future, it's gone uh, forever under water rights law. So high priority is to make sure that we're uh, keeping that water as well as that we're allowing towns to have adequate water for their own growth and allowing us to concentrate more of future growth into urban areas and maybe less into our rural areas. Um, we need to plan for now and implement water conservation, efficient delivery systems and storage solutions for the future. We heard that some of that is already going on and that's great, but really thinking ahead for what's the water gonna be like in 20 and 40 years and how do we have enough water at the right time to address the changes that we see happening. And then managing growth through climate informed water planning. We have a lot of watershed planning processes that have happened over the years here. Uh, those you know, will benefit from using the, the forecasted water availability uh, data and uh, uh, estimates from the climate impacts group to prepare for water changing water regimes and, and managing the growth around that future. So those are three of the priority actions that came out of the water uh, area. Um, resilient, healthy, abundant natural systems. A lot of work by this group um, looking across all different habitats and identifying the type of actions that we need to do across all those habitats, which is in the uh, center of the, of the graphic here. And, and you know, I think one of the things that came out of this is this quote at the bottom left is that we manage our landscapes for uh, the conditions of the next 10 decades. So as we think about our forest treatments and we think about our uplands and our open lands, thinking uh, as best we can and understanding those changes and then uh, being proactive about, about addressing uh, the adjustments and, and preserving the biodiversity and habitats and ecosystems in that light. Uh, we had um, 26 actions identified in this section of the plan, very detailed with a lot of expertise around the table. Um, and the top actions that we identified for sort of immediate focus are really aligning our community and then accelerating the pace and scale of forest treatments for health and resilience in the context of that sort of 10 decades thinking. So we need to have um, you know, more resources come in and we need to get ourselves on the same page so that we can um, um, you know, have, have processes move maybe more quickly than they have in the past. In a world where the climate is changing, time is not on our side to, uh, to wait and wait and wait to make, make uh, our, our uh, treatments happen. And then just sort of the core efforts of, of really doubling down and bringing more resources to protect and restore the habitats that we already have and the ecosystems and the biodiversity so that those can um, do their own adaptation and we're not um, further uh, uh, harming their, um, their viability. And then as we saw with water, uh, looking at how we manage growth through the climate impacts land, and land use planning and form lens. So bringing uh, those uh, uh, forecasts for flooding and water availability into managing growth and protecting the natural systems. Our third um, outcome, and Sarah really pointed to the, you know, this is getting to the core of our own well-being. Um, and um, really this is being prepared and safe in the event of adversity uh, and then actually being able to recover from that adversity. Um, the group uh, that worked on this identified these six different health and safety goals, become smoke ready, uh, be much more holistic about fire wise and fire adapted landscaping, um, creating safe spaces, uh, improving our road transportation, uh, addressing the supply chain when there are uh, events to make sure we have the essentials in the valley 
and having improved emergency response. I think we all agree that we've improved some in these areas, but as we look to the future, there'll be more fire events as we've talked about and, um, and more, um, uh, more impact. So uh, being proactive here, the, the themes that came out in terms of recommended priority actions were uh, advancing the Metau as a fire adapted community. Again, taking a holistic um, equitable uh, approach to that, implementing the smoke ready community initiative didn't say it uh, explicitly, but in the natural systems, we need to reintroduce fire into our landscape in more of a controlled way. So that will mean more smoke events at different times that we are having on purpose. So we need to have a, a ability to adjust to that uh, and protect the health of those who are most vulnerable to, to smoke issues. Expanding firewise to increase the safety of our landscapes around our homes and then ultimately to find uh, a pathway towards adopting building codes that, that address the impact of that fire or wildlife urban interface. Uh, there's a lot of good models out there and we need to find the right thing for the Valley and uh, the county as a whole really and work collaboratively to make that happen. Um, fourth outcome, the livable and affordable built environment. Um, many different goals here. This, this sector and this group really overlaps with our work on mitigation. So we really want to have a low carbon, um, reduce our emissions and also, um, you know, adapt to the, the, our buildings to, you know, the changing uh, climate and also to the pressures on our, uh, uh, on our systems from more people living here and more scarce housing. So um, zoning to encourage density, advancing green building, um, uh, and fire safe building standards that I just mentioned, uh, doing a community tree plan and increasing our tree canopy within our urban areas and uh, accelerating the work we're doing on affordable housing are gonna be key things in this area for a sustainable, uh, safe future. Um, we talked uh, uh, from the mayor of Winthrop and Twisp on some of the economic issues we face and we saw the uh, the uh, issue of, of how uh, the changing snowpack and, and you know, how our, how our recreation economy will be affected by, by uh, the changing climate. So uh, this group really dove into uh, thinking about ways to diversify our economy, ways to have that future be both meet the needs of recreation uh, economy for tourists, but also meet the needs of the community. Uh, the issue of broadband and having uh, uh, access to affordable high-speed broadband uh, is, is, uh, was a priority that was brought out across several different groups and adapting our recreation facilities and developments to both, again, um, have strong uh, facilities for a changing in environment and climate and have ones that meet our community needs. Uh, and then there's a real role for businesses here. And so there was a discussion about and a focus on providing uh, education for climate-friendly businesses. Um, so um, the top priorities there were again adapt those facilities. It's going to take time to put that in place, um, uh, do the education and outreach, and support access to uh, affordable high-speed broadband. Uh, the agricultural sector, um, or as we've said earlier, already experiencing some of the impacts of climate change. They're also already becoming um, more resilient and making adjustments. Um, we have these four goals in this area and 12 different actions. Um, and, and really the actions in this area are about almost doubling down and doing more of what we're already doing, uh, but bringing more resources. We need to understand our agricultural sector better and better appreciate uh, the farmers and the work they're doing so that we can uh, you know, <clears throat> better support them. We have different ideas about how to have uh, more financially stable and sustainable farms and what that we can do as a community for that. There's a lot of technical assistance programs out there, but they need more resources and those resources can get more focused over time on addressing the resiliency in the face of the climate change. And then farms can be a carbon sink as well as the forests and ways to do that are, are in the plan. Um, so the recommended actions here were to create a uh, resiliency fund to help farmers adapt. And one way to maybe fund that is to have a local carbon so almost an informal offset market to provide some of the funding for that. Um, and, and maybe other, um, you know, GoFundMe or, or uh, entrepreneurship type funding can help 
create this fund. And then expanding our efforts to work with farmland owners to protect more agricultural lands through the conservation easements and related activities, as well as working to increase markets for local farm products so we can get more of the, um, the great uh, local food and produce and uh, meat and eggs and chickens and other things from our, from our farming community and strengthen their viability. Um, then our final outcome is about the carbon neutral metal. And again, a lot of discussions about what made sense for us to do here in the Valley, recognizing that even though we have a small footprint, we're part of a much bigger effort to really move in the right direction. Uh, we also realize it's hard for us to actually track how our emissions get reduced each year. So our goal was about saying we systematically commit to reducing them, to taking individual and collective actions each year. Um, and committing to the carbon neutral state based and science based targets, which we'll look at in a minute. We identified solutions in um, uh, transportation, waste and consumption, which we'll hear about from our speakers, uh, the built environment and land based sequestration. And uh, the comprehensive transportation initiative on the right includes accelerating um, the shift to EVs, expanding the reach and effectiveness of Trango. Uh, creating rideshare programs and maybe that app and improving the infrastructure for non-motorized active transportation. Um, other other uh, recommended prior actions here. Again, we'll hear about a little bit more from our, our panelists. Uh, electric vehicles are coming and a big priority of the state is to electrify um, both you know, transportation and buildings. So our uh, local utilities can be proactive about thinking about how to be prepared for that and making the investments that are needed for that to happen. Um, finally, um, the, um, you know, all of this ties back to sort of what do we do uh, across these different areas to build capacity and awareness to engage all of our community in this effort to, to educate and, and track progress and to engage. So, um, we have a cross-cutting priority action about organizing for ag advocacy, organizing ourselves to go to Olympia and maybe even to uh, Washington DC for the funding, the policy changes needed to help make resiliency happen and reduce emissions. We can't do it all ourselves, we're part of bigger systems. Creating that uh, climate-friendly resilient metal guide and brochure that could be for tourists, for businesses, for homeowners. Um, and then creating and distributing a survey that allows us to track our progress along the way. Uh, the graph on the right just shows you from an emission standpoint what the state has committed to and the scale of that, the slope of that, of that, um, of that, you know, a downward, um, you know, requirement to actually meet the 1.52 degrees and, and, and meet the state and science-based targets. So, um, Big effort, but again, leaning into it, moving forward and being proactive, we can do our part to make it happen. And particularly with our forest resources, we can help be a carbon sink. Um, I'm just gonna close in about one minute with what we can do as individuals. Um, you know, There's a lot of different ways that we can um, make our own actions um, in, in our own homes, in our own businesses, in our own lives. Um, reducing emissions, by um, you know, starting by measuring uh, the carbon footprint, and then we'll put on the, the website, you know, maybe a, a user-friendly uh, version that we found that actually the Nature Conservancy works, and you can take a pledge about what you're going to do. Uh, transportation, obviously, we need to do things to reduce that uh, number. Driving less, purchasing a hybrid or EV when those become um, available. We're already reducing air travel because of COVID, so we can see the adjustments we can make in, in our lifestyles. Um, it, it, you know, some of it is really difficult, but some of it also has uh, the ability to reduce emissions. Uh, eating local, eating more plant-based foods. Uh, big numbers come from uh, the food systems and how we uh, eat food on the planet, so we can do our part here. We'll hear more about reduce and reuse and a sharing economy from um, Betsy, and then uh, saving energy through, um, you know, starting with an audit and also starting just with identifying where you're losing heat in your home and doing more insulation. In terms of being resilient, um, firewising um, your home and community and working uh, locally to, uh, to 
develop a, your own disaster preparedness plan. Uh, there's a whole lot of possibilities around getting insurance for people who have difficulty getting it in fire prone areas. Um, and some of that information again is here on the right and will be in our um, plan, becoming a Meta Valley Clean Air Ambassador to help people address the issues of air quality that we're facing, uh, stewarding the landscapes that we have, and then just really looking out for our neighbors, uh, creating that phone and email list so we're able to connect with each other, uh, seeing who's at risk from a health standpoint or from a need standpoint, and uh, reaching out to help them. So those are some of the things we can do uh, that will all you know, keep us um, active and engaged and, and the Meta Valley uh, becoming resilient and our emissions going down you know, in line with the commitments that we need to make in the science. Um, so that's the overview of the plan. And um, now I think we move to hearing from some of our task force members about um, their thoughts on this plan. And we have some mixture of slides and just mm -hmm. people uh, talking. So the task force members can um, show their faces. Here's our community panel presenters, Betsy. If you know most of these pieces, is going to start us off. Then we'll go to Rockland um, and talk about some of the things in Winthrop. And Rockland's been active on pretty much all the meetings. I really appreciate her cross-cutting contributions to this effort. Uh, Liz Walker is focused on the clean air issues and health. Um, Julie on the economic issues. Kelly on how do we address some of the equity and, and the vulnerable populations. Alyssa has been uh, a true contributor on bringing the agricultural voice to our process. Um, Sarah for natural systems and for water. And then Kent Woodruff will bring us home with um, uh, his discussions of natural systems. So Betsy, we wanna start with you and I will put your slide up and then you just tell me when you want me to advance to the next slide. Okay, thanks Mark. Um, I'm not sure if this is the most current set, but we will go for it. So um, I participated on behalf of Metal Recycles in the uh, mitigation task force. And we focused on how we might both um, in an infrastructure way and individually systematically reduce our use of fossil fuel and its emissions. Next slide. Um, in his most recent film, Sir da David Attenborough uh, illustrated very beautifully that there is just no waste in nature. What is um, a discard of one system feeds the next system. And he implored us to please just don't waste. So I um, take a lot of inspiration from that and hope you do too. Next slide. We often look at our um, greenhouse gas emissions in, in a pie chart that looks like this, where the three largest contributors are transportation, electricity, and industry. And it's important to ask ourselves, well, what are these three sectors doing? And a big chunk of what they're doing is extracting, manufacturing, and transporting um, goods and food to consumers. Next slide. And that accounts for about 42% of greenhouse gas emissions, 29% on goods and 13% on foods. So we have a huge opportunity through our everyday choices to reduce that 42%. Next slide. Um, we can skip that one. Next slide. Most of us grew up thinking that recycling was about reducing litter or about saving a tree. And the truth is it's about saving energy. When we make um, things like cans and paper and glass from scratch, in other words, from raw materials, it takes a huge investment of um, fossil fuels basically to, to make those products. And when we make them the next time from recycled feedstocks, that investment is preserved and it uses a lot less energy because they can be worked into the recipe with a lot lower heat. 
So uh, another th important thing for you to know about this slide is that four of these things, aluminum, copper, steel, and glass can be recycled almost indefinitely. So they continue to preserve that investment. Next slide. I think that's it for you. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, a couple of um, things that we focused on in the task force um, actionable items were, uh, we thought a lot about MetHow at Home and the work they do to help community members and focusing on um, insulation and weatherization. We thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if we had a crew of volunteers who were experienced with assessing um, weatherization opportunities and providing the technical assistance to help businesses and homeowners um, make those changes. And that might require a little advocacy as well to provide the funding for that. And then in terms of the, the Metal conservation ethic, there are two simple things um, that you can do right now. And the biggest one is question whether the waste you generate is inevitable and look for opportunities to eliminate all you can by buying durable items, by buying only as much as you know you will use, whether it's food or construction materials. And buy local, buy used, share what you have, borrow it from your neighbor or a friend or Metow Recycles. And then lastly, the second thing is uh, weatherize your home and help your neighbors weatherize their homes. And there's lots more that Mitigation Task Force uh, talked about, but I am now going to introduce Rockland Culp, fourth generation Okanagan Valley, Okanagan County resident and awesome town planner for Winthrop. Thanks, Betsy. Um, so I am, I'm the town planner for the town of Winthrop. So I'm kind of going to talk from that perspective. Um, and um, yeah, it's been, a, this has been a, a fantastic process, lots of really great minds um, thinking about all different aspects of this. And I've, I've learned a lot through the process. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, sort of the focus on the built environment and um, infrastructure and um, how that connects to mitigation. Um, being a planner, I'm going to highlight, number one, the need for land use planning that sets us up for long term solutions in the built environment. Basically, the pattern um, that we end up with on the landscape starts with our planning. And so um, we need to set ourselves up for success with, with that and, um, and some am ambitious goals and some um, buy-in around some patterns of development that will help us be more efficient in our use of resources. Um, so, um, Again, I want to highlight that you know land use planning around efficient development um, and also solid up-to-date infrastructure that is more efficient in delivery of the resources that we use, water um, and then transportation infrastructure, all of the different um, structures that we put in place that support how we live on the landscape. Um, and then also, um, one of the things in terms of land use is to consider the, imp the impacts of possible in-migration due to climate change. Um, we don't really have a lot of knowns around that, but we can definitely anticipate that there will be a lot of climate migration happening. I think it's already happening uh, in other places that are affected and where I think we will see pressures. And so careful land use planning and efficient around efficient use of our resources is gonna be all the more important for that reason. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is transport or transportation system. Obviously, the transportation sector came out as one of the lead sources of greenhouse gases locally. Um, and so that's one place we have a really significant opportunity to do some good. So um, the, the areas that we highlighted are um, having a solid connect, well-connected transportation system that um, minimizes the amount of travel that needs to happen, um, electrification of the transportation system, 
um, improving our local transit and rideshare type programs so that there's less time where um, we're driving alone in cars to go 10, 20 miles um, at a time. And then also making active transportation a more natural and easy and safe choice for people. I think right now, um, you know, there, um, it can be hard to get on a bike and ride from Twist to Winthrop if you don't feel safe doing it and not everybody does for sure, especially, um, you know, we don't feel safe putting our kids on bikes and sending them up and down the valley. Um, and um, another area that I would highlight is housing um, and housing affordability in particular. I think it was highlighted in the presentation that one of the things we can expect is our cost of living to increase increasingly go up in relation to the pressures of climate change. And so we need to get really get on that. We're already seeing the impacts from the fires and the loss of housing from that. So um, continuing to emphasize efficient development of housing, supporting programs that already exist like the Mount Housing Trust and um, Okanagan Housing Authority, and working with them to generate solutions that work um, for all different types of families and um, individuals that live in the Valley. Um, and then making sure that we're thinking about, as Betsy was indicating, <clears throat> efficient use of the materials um, in our construction because um, waste there is, is another form of loss um, to our systems. So, and then um, the, the fourth uh, little point I wanted to make, or it's not really a little point, but the fourth thing I wanted to emphasize is um, the importance of that concept of equity in the built environment. Um, we want to make sure that the expense of mitigating for climate change um, is supported in ways that the, make the Met Howe Valley an affordable place for people to live. And unless we keep that equity piece kind of central in our thinking, um, it becomes harder and harder for people um, on the lower end of our economic spectrum to, to survive in the valley. So uh, yeah, those are the things I wanted to highlight. And I I'm going to hand it over to Liz Walker, who has been director of Clean Air MetHow for the past several years. Um, she seeks solutions for a sustainable clean air shed in the MetHow Valley. And she is an environmental health toxicologist by training and the mother of two awesome kids. Take it away, Liz. Thanks, Rocklin. Um, so as Rockland said, I participated on the health sector of this Climate Action Plan Task Force. And you saw that one of the priorities articulated there was implement a smoke ready community initiative. So um, I have three minutes and I hope to convince you that a sustainably clean air shed for the METAO is possibly as critical as a sustainably clean water shed for our resilient future. So um, I took over leadership of Clean Air Mattel for, from Raleigh Bowden several years ago, and I've since worked with many, many partners in the Valley towards clean air for everyone. Uh, the hard reality is that our smoke exposure is going to increase likely for the next few decades, both due to wildfires with near and far origins, increases in prescribed burning to improve forest health, which are critically needed, outdoor burning from growth or land clearing, private land management and cleanup for those of us who need to deal with all our leaves or pine needles or have 10, 20, 30 acres or more to fire wise, and from our longstanding source of air pollution, which is wood smoke from winter home heating. What does all this smoke mean for our health and safety? We know that the disease burden includes increased rates of lung disease, cardiac events, and increases in overall mortality. But what we really don't know is how prevalent or serious those effects are going to be. This is something of an unprecedented experiment. And what the effects or how serious they'll be on our kids growing up in this new reality for things like the productivity of livestock and agriculture that also depend on clean air. And certainly for people like our outdoor workers who have to care for animals or the harvest during wildfire seasons. So this is the bad news. The good news is that much of a Metau Valley specific and comprehensive plan to reduce unnecessary burning where possible and protect our health where needed has already been drafted. It incorporates both concepts of building preparedness for inevitable and uncontrollable smoke and programs to reduce that smoke where possible. So the first steps of becoming a smoke ready community really involve an outreach campaign to broaden our awareness about the importance of our air quality and the likelihood of how that's going to change um, into the future. 
This would include things such as how to find information. We have a fantastic new resource at cleanairmetau.org that gives us some um, very hyper-local and relevant information, as well as a unique network. Most of you may know that we have 23 purple air sensors uh, from Lost River Airport to Pateros that give us real-time air quality in addition to two sensors that the Department of Ecology maintains in Winthrop and Twist. So we have a lot of air quality data. Um, and so it's important that we know how to access and implement and interpret that and how we might need to change our behaviors. Uh, Smoke Ready Community Outreach would discuss how to protect our health. So two critical actions here are messaging and programs to ensure that everyone can create clean indoor air during our wildfire smoke events. A second action is to normalize and help mitigate the mental and emotional effects of living with annual natural disasters and smoke. It's one of the top things that our healthcare providers have reported being concerned about with regards to our health and well-being. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side of protecting ourselves, smoke readiness also really includes our, our coordinated efforts to reduce smoke wherever possible. This could be things like promoting clean home heating, composting, um, I'm sorry, promoting clean home heating and developing affordable large-scale alternatives to outdoor burning, such as chipping or composting or pilots such as our biochar initiative underway. Um, when we have to burn to dispose of vegetative material, we can promote best practices for drying fuels and burning on a day with good ventilation, never on a day with a burn ban or stagnation warning. These simple practices can dramatically reduce potential smoke exposures in our community. So what do we need to implement this smoke ready plan? Um, it needs coordination and funding. Like the Climate Action Plan overall, many, many partners have a piece of this preparedness as well as implementation, including public health, healthcare and social workers, individuals, towns, and the county. So I um, thank you all for showing up tonight and thank you for your consideration of how you can be part of that smoke ready community. Oh, sorry, and now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Julie, who is not in the Meto, as we can see currently. Thank you, Liz. Um, yes, hi everyone. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Um, I'm Julie Tate Libby and um, I'm the program director for TwistWorks and I've been working with the um, economy subcommittee for the past year, um, going over ideas and plans and lots of conversation. And I wanna say from the outset that our biggest conversation has been around equity and access to resources for everyone. And just with the idea that um, you know, climate change cannot be divorced from people's daily lives and how they make their living. And this is not an issue between, you know, environmentalists and non-environmentalists, but that, you know, we want to create something that everybody can um, get on board with. So um, briefly, the four main actions that we came up with was one, to diversify our local economy, um, to advance a universal affordable broadband, adapt and develop facilities that promote community connectivity. And we had a lot of discussions in here on trail systems and commuter trails and things like that. Um, and then the fourth one was to provide education for businesses and organizations. And Mark, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and um, I wanted to say here too, Joshua said I should mention this, that um, we launched a survey at TwistWorks three weeks ago. It's called the Resident Second Homeowner and Remote Worker Survey. And as of today, we had 275 responses and climate change came out as 73% of people said it was the number one top priority of concern for the Meta Valley. And this was out of 10 different issues of concern, including poverty and gentrification and things like that. So. Um, I think that's really telling that we're all on the same page um, and that we really do know that climate change matters for the Medha Valley. So I wanted to put that in there. That's kind of a new bit of information. Um, so the two things I wanna discuss in detail are diversifying our local economy. And we are lucky in the Medha to have the Medha Investment Network. Uh, local investment networks are great because they keep the investment money, the interest that somebody pays um, on a loan, they keep it in a local area. So it's kind of a closed system. Um, and so also with local investment networks, you can really promote the, a diversity of jobs and opportunities and businesses that you know, non-traditional loans you know, cannot achieve. Um, so I think expanding and relying more on our local investment network here um, is a wonderful resource and to think about ways that we can 
um, really reach people with different and innovative ideas. You know, we need an economy that is not just based on tourism because that's so affected by climate change. Um, and then the second kind of agenda with that was to shop local. And, you know, we've heard a lot about that tonight and we know that shopping local is great, but we believe that a concerted mitigated effort to educate people on the value of shopping local and how that can reduce waste and transportation and emissions and things like that is a big part of our economy that we can actually really do this. Um, and then to promote carbon friendly businesses like biochar, um, there's been quite a bit of conversation around that um, and other non extractive industries um, that can be healthy and good for the environment and that can increase jobs and wages here in the Metau. Um, and then the second um, sort of agenda item that we talked about was um, to provide education for businesses and organizations. Um, and part of this would include a good tourist brochure. And so we are actually moving ahead. Um, partnering with um, WasteWise and Metal Recycles um, and some other groups to come up with, we want to educate our visitors to say, hey, you know, driving up to Washington Pass every day that you're here, maybe not the best thing, or maybe we can do a ride share, but to come up with like the top 10 um, climate friendly things that visitors and tourists can do in the Medhow to alleviate their impact on our natural environment. Um, and so that's one of the um, areas we'd like to address. And then the second one is like a good business brochure and this would be part of creating a local climate friendly um, endorsement program so businesses could really lead the way. Um, and we've talked a lot about that businesses in the private sector can be kind of ambassadors for climate change. So when people come over from Seattle and they stop in Mazama, that they can, you know, the businesses will be climate friendly businesses and they can help kind of promote the idea that this is who we are and this is our values here. Um, and so we've had a lot of conversation about how we can do that from the business community. And as part of that, um, the TwistWorks launched the Small Business Emergency Grant this year during COVID, um, and we funded uh, 48 businesses. We've gone through four cycles of funding for these very, they're small grants, $1,500. Um, but in the future, actually starting in January, we'll be pivoting those grants to um, have a call out for businesses who are looking to pivot and have climate friendly practices, whether it's installing solar panels or something like that. So that's another immediate thing that we're excited about um, encouraging. So we really want to help um, come find our business community and encourage environmentally responsible practices um, and show that everybody can do it. So um, I think that's all I had to say for that. Um, and after me, uh, Kelly Edwards is the Associate Director for Room One and she'll be talking about um, equity from um, their perspective. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, hello everyone. I, I participated in the task force on, on the health and human impact subcommittee along with Liz Walker. And um, it really has, I, I'm just so grateful to the entire task force and the leadership about how central uh, value at, um, the whole group has made equity a central value to how we are thinking about solutions in this plan. Um, and I, I think you can all imagine how, you know, the changing climate creates a, a genuine phenomenon called eco-anxiety for, for all of us, where something feels so large and, and so big and often so beyond our control. And one of the, the beauties of this, uh, of an action plan like this is I think all the solutions you're hearing about from all the task force members are genuinely things within our reach that we can do either individually or together. So I think taking those steps to, to help alleviate some of that anxiety and stress that we feel in the face of climate change. And you can imagine layering that eco-anxiety on top of um, folks that are experiencing daily stressors, just trying to get by, you know, just trying to make ends meet trying to find safe and stable housing and livable wages for their, for their families and their kiddos. Um, so we're just layering stress upon stress. And the, the joy of this action plan is how many of the solutions are solutions that many of us have been advocating for for some time as being win-wins for our working class, lower income populations. Um, the ideas of affordable housing solutions that are more centrally located um, to support a workforce that can sustain this valley. 
is something you know I know a, a number of us have been working for for a long time. The idea of improved public transit options so that our our workforce can go up and down the valley as needed um, to get get to work even at the the off hours to to staff our restaurants and and other things. Um, the idea of weatherization has, is fantastic, and we talk to a lot of different elders and uh, fam uh, families who would love to weatherize their homes or their rental units or their lower income housing. And they just don't have either the means to do it or um, the physical capability to do the weatherization work. And we can imagine within this plan, one of our ideas is thinking about a job core um, that can support and fund kind of a workforce of younger folks, more able-bodied folks who can get out there and really help weatherize these rental and low-income housing units so that we can really make efficient use of, of the housing structures that we do have already in place. Uh, and then I think an additional solution that hasn't yet been mentioned, but that has is again, one we've been long advocating for as being a benefit to our working families in the Valley is this idea of an indoor rec center. I think Liz touched on the need for clean indoor air um, during certain critical times of the year that we know we're going to see the increasing fires, the increasing smoke, um, that both physical and mental health outlet to have kids and young people have and adults have a place to go to play, to um, to play basketball, to just exercise together. You know, we, we really missed our swimming pool being open this year. And uh, the idea that we could have a year round facility that could create programming for all ages, all economic classes is something that's really promising. And I think finally, just that, just the diverse, when I think of all these innovative ideas for businesses, uh, different industries, different sectors, I, I do see a changing and diversifying job um, workforce that's here. And I know we've got major parts of our community who are multi-generational and want to stay here, want to stay a part of this valley, um, don't want to leave, uh, don't want to commute from far away to get to work in the valley. Um, and I think some of these changes that are being proposed in the task force report can help get us there. So thanks everyone for your work. And I'm gonna pass the mic to Alyssa Jumars with the Metal Conservancy. Thanks, Kelly. Um, okay, so as a participant in the Climate Action Task Force, I volunteered to reach out to several of the farmers and ranchers that I have the pleasure of working with um, through my role at the Metal Conservancy as an Ag Coordinator. Um, so I just wanted to share with you really quickly, um, I surveyed about two dozen farmers and ranchers and asked them essentially four questions. Um, number one, what are the impacts that you, impacts of climate change that you are already observing or preparing for? And number two, what additional support do you need to be able to better prepare? Um, number three, what kind of conservation practices are you already using on your farm to either reduce emissions or to build healthy soils and carbon in the soil. Um, and number four, which of those conservation practices would you do more of if you could afford to? Um, so uh, I feel like it's important to share some good news tonight. Um, and I just wanted to share two main takeaways from that outreach. Um, number one, many of you may already know this, but Farmers and ranchers in the Metahau Valley have a particularly strong conservation conservation ethic. Um, so it kind of it comes as no surprise that the twenty three does or twenty three farmers that I surveyed are already actively engaged in a wide variety of conservation practices that support soil health and put carbon back into the soil. Um, for example, using cover crops, reduced tillage perennial soil covers, um, holistic grazing, grazing regimes, mulches, or a variety of soil amendments that stimulate soil biology. Um, and they all indicated that they would love to do more if they, if they could afford to. Um, so takeaway number two, 
um, all of these farms are already actively preparing for the very diverse um, and very specific impacts of climate change for each of their operations, whether that is hay, dairy, cattle, um, orchard fruit, diversified veggies, grain, or farm to table meat production. Um, they're all working really hard to build healthy, resilient soils. Um, and many of them are upgrading to more efficient irrigation systems that can better meet the needs of their crops in a changing climate. Um, and you know, some are installing shade or hail or even um, insect netting. And um, you know, they're building backup energy systems and implementing firewise structure protections. They're planting new drought tolerant crops or forages or cover crops. Um, they're shifting their growing seasons and building more cold storage. And they're developing new products and new market channels that allow for more flexibility. Um, and yeah, <laughs> the list goes on. Um, but you know, I think I think it's important just to recognize um, how you know farmers and ranchers are just characteristically you know pretty tough and clever and adaptable. Um, but they also need and deserve help from all of us. Um, adapting is going to be really expensive, and farmers are literally on the front lines of climate change. And, you know, as a community that cares about working agriculture and that really loves the pastoral nature of this place, we, we need to put our money where our mouths are and support our farms during um, the turbulent times ahead. So um, I'm really excited to pitch an idea to this audience tonight that our community build a farm resiliency fund to help farmers um, prepare for the challenges that they are already anticipating as well for those extreme weather events that you know you simply can't anticipate um so yeah uh thank you um it's now my great pleasure to introduce sarah lane who is the administer administrator who keeps the ship upright at the met how watershed council thanks Alyssa. Should have a slide here. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so as we've been talking about, um, uh, water rose to the top was a pretty, uh, Im very important topic. Um, I started out with the natural systems subcommittee and we actually sort of needed to form our own little sub subcommittee on water to just talk about it as a topic on its own. Um, because as we know, water is essential for our life here, for our towns, our agriculture, our homes, businesses, fish and wildlife, and our natural systems. Um, and I really feel this list is uh, a list with equal standing for each of these water users because the life that we value so much here depends on abundant clean water for all of these things. So how do we address these needs? With water patterns changing, uh, with the drier summers, more precipitation as rain in the fall and spring, uh, one of the priorities we identified is to increase our storage capacity um, and extra rainfall could actually create an opportunity here. Last fall, the Methow Watershed Council gathered people for Water 2066 to discuss what we wanted to see in our valley 50 years into the future. One of the questions we asked is what kind of storage do we all support? And we heard pretty, cl pretty clearly that it, we don't want to see a big dam. That's not what, that's not what we want. So this leaves it to us to be creative and use many different ways of slowing down and storing water on the landscape. Uh, several organizations, organizations are already doing this. Uh, the Meadow Beaver Project, Meadow Salmon Recovery Foundation are already working on projects that increase natural storage, um, helping beavers, uh, helping beavers be, uh, find, a, find a home with landowners where they already live on the river, um, creating beaver analogs, improving habitat, uh, connecting side channel, side channel restoration, and just uh, increasing the complexity uh, on our landscape and our floodplains uh, will help it more store more water just by doing that. 
Um, larger scale projects are gonna have their place in our strategies too, such as improved water delivery infrastructure. Um, some other big ones are infiltration galleries, recharge structures, uh, and these projects are gonna be farther in the future. They're gonna take a lot of time, money, and coordination. Um, and essentially we're just looking for more water, more ways to store water across the basin when it's plentiful and make it more available when it's needed. We must also protect our local water resource use to ensure that water is available for our towns, fish and homes and businesses. We can use local water banking and drought leasing to address some agricultural needs while supporting healthy natural systems. Um, Trout Unlimited and some other community members are currently working to ensure that our water rights stay here in the valley where we need them. Another near-term need is water for towns, as Mayor Sue had spoken to earlier. And as we've been witnessing, um, growth is happening rapidly. And our community identifies as encouraging growth in and around the towns as preferable. Um, both the Watershed Council's Water 2066 project and Resilient Methow processes uh, both show that people support more cluster growth, which will allow for more efficient delivery of services. Stakeholders and community members will need to be involved with crafting a plan that meets our water and infrastructure needs. And I think we'll see work starting on that project in the next year or so. Water conservation and efficiency have a ton of, a pen of potential for the near term. Um, these strategies can be used by large, large farms to home gardens. Um, it can be as simple as encouraging the use of rain barrels or drip irrigation to really smart and efficient mm -hmm. equipment for irrigating, irrigating large acreage. Many of the water goals that you'll see in this plan have already have people working on them. As this plan puts into action, bringing these folks together and sharing information and getting creative will help us meet all these goals. Next, I'd like to introduce Kent Woodruff. He's what retired wildlife biologist and he'll be see, speaking on the natural system priorities that we are working on. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, start video. You're good to go, Kent. We can see you. Okay. I thank you. Thank you for that help. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. You know, it's exciting to me that we're doing this. Uh, it's, it's fun to have worked for a while to uh, be part of this team. Sally, I want to shout out to you to be able to say thanks for saying let's do this. Let's do some things rather than uh, uh, plan for it anymore. And I think that's what's happening. Uh, Julia, it was fun to see from your perspective that 73% of the respondents did a good job of saying um, uh, this is a top priority. So very quickly, uh, Natural Systems looked at these five things here um, on our uh, assignment and tackled what's going to happen for these areas. What I was encouraged about is there are lots of bigger things that are currently being working worked on like uh, forest management for the next 10 decades, as Mark pointed out, trying to take care of some of the big things that we are going to uh, want to hang on to, like really good intact resilient habitat. And like Sarah, you just mentioned to making sure that we have water for the resources that we all need, especially in stream water for uh, animals. What I'd like to do is highlight five key things that I think are examples of what we can do in little uh, efforts individually or, or small collectively to be able to 
um, tackle some of the things that are going to make things better for wildlife and fish and plants while we're turning down the carbon faucet. Next slide, please. So stream temperature is one of the very most detrimental things that is happening to climate change for our aquatic systems. In this slide, you can see some trees that are providing shade on the stream. Stream shade is one of the best offsets for stream temperature impacts. And so the science is let's hang on to as much stream shade as we can. This is an example of that. That's a small thing that we can do taking care of the trees that are along the streams. Next slide, please. Here's an example of something that uh, happened last week. Uh, a local resident here in the valley drove over the loop and found some dead pine siskins along the highway that were attracted to um, de-icer salt along the, along the Loop Loop Highway. Now, local Audubon group is working with Department of Transportation to tackle what alternative ways we can use to make sure our roads are safe with uh, less attractive de-icers. Next slide. Recently, researchers from Washington State University and University of Washington found that there is a chemical in entire rubber that is shed onto the roads that washes into streams and rivers that kills salmon. That was just out last week. <clears throat> what we can do here is find a place for the road or the snow that we take off the roads in our towns uh, and try to make sure that we're not putting that close to the rivers and streams so that it melts and, and also goes into the stream to cause problems for salmon. So we'll offset some of the impacts that climate change is providing for salmon if we take care of where we put some of the uh, offset snow removal. Next slide. When we disturb soil, we get weeds. We, I think we all know that. That's something that um, is a common thing that we're all working on trying to fight here in the valley. <clears throat> This is a weed called burdock. Burdock is a weed that is difficult for bats because bats get entangled. It's like Velcro for bats. So one of the things that we can do to help um, all wildlife in the face of climate change is to make sure that we're not disturbing more soil than we need to and to reduce weeds that we are uh, seeing around us. Next slide. Finally, as Sarah mentioned, we can be careful with water. If, we're, if we reduce our water use, if, if every one of us reduced our water use by 5%, that would be a huge amount of savings that would be beneficial to certainly all of our natural systems that need water, but also all of us that need water. So these, these five examples are some that, that give us a chance to understand that if we if we work hard to make things better for plants and wildlife, it is the best thing that we can do while we're trying to reduce our carbon output and, and reduce the impact of climate change. So these small things collectively, the, there are a million things that we can do if we continue to try to pick off all of these things. So thank you very much. I'll pass it back to Mark. All right, thank, thank you. you all of our um, task force members for sharing and, and elaborating on some of the solutions and options. It was really helpful to get um, more in depth. So I really appreciate that. So now we move to Joshua, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, the next phase of this work, community involvement and the implementation. So again, thanks everybody. Joshua. Thanks, Mark. So as, as you've heard from each of our panelists, equity has emerged throughout. Oh, could you do next slide, please? This one? Yeah, that's it, yeah. So yeah, we've heard, we've heard all of our panelists talk, talk uh, back one to the equity, please. You got it. There we go, perfect. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so we, we've heard them them all refer to equity throughout the plan uh, that we've we've defined as providing added support to disadvantaged groups so everyone can experience the benefits from our adaptation and mitigation actions. This requires special attention to the most vulnerable in our community to, to balance disparities so we can all thrive. In her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, uh, plant ecologist and founding director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, Robin Wall Kimmerer writes that all flourishing is mutual. What else are we learning now unless it is the opposite? When we fail to be mutual, we cannot flourish. We are only as vibrant, healthy, and alive as the most vulnerable among us. The way that equity shows up in the planning process, the plan itself, and future implementation is conveyed in these four steps you see on the slide, where in the mission, vision, and values, we define and explicitly state a commitment to equity. We undertake a process that deeply engages community members. And moving into implementation, our actions lead to equity outcomes that respond to community needs, reduce climate vulnerabilities, and increase community resilience. Then we evaluate equity successes and challenges to improve our effort going forward. Next slide, please. In putting equity into practice while addressing climate change, we can be multi-solving, which defined at Climate Interactive is where policies and actions help protect the climate while also providing other co-benefits, such as improving health, disaster resilience, the economy, and access to healthy food and clean water. They help connect us to the neutral, natural world and people around us. And they do that while saving time and energy. They are in short win-win solutions for people and the climate, precisely as we heard Kelly emphasize in, in her presentation. Next slide, please. The, the power in making this, this plan actionable relies on collective involvement. I recently heard Running Grass, the director of the Three Circle Center, share what he describes as the characteristics of belonging. He emphasized the importance of getting to co-create the future of our communities. This requires making demands about actualizing that possible future. That's precisely what's happening here in the Met How, and there's still time to get involved. So we invite you to review the, the draft plan summary uh, on the Resilient Met How website and you can contribute your input uh, via community input form that's also on the website. Uh, on that form, you can also sign up to learn about educational workshops and forums. Uh, and if you'd like to be involved in, in hands-on projects, that's, that's where you can sign up. If you have any uh, groups that you're a part of, uh, an organization, a faith group, uh, any contingency that you or any uh, any group that you think would be interested in participating in a stakeholder meeting, uh, reach out to us via info at resilientmethow.org, which is also on the website. Uh, we'll be continuing those over the, the next month and a half. Uh, and then review the full plan draft. It'll be released early in 2021, and it'll also be on the Resilient Methow website. Uh, feel free to send us your questions, comments, and ideas via email again on, on Resilient Matt Howe. Uh, next slide, please. So moving forward, we will be revising a draft of the plan that we'll share with the public in early 2021 and, and finalizing after we receive more public um, feedback on the plan. And then our next steps in the process include continued outreach. We're holding stakeholder meetings to get targeted input on aspects of the plan that relate directly to the work of so many organizations and agencies already engaged in, in climate related work. We are we're identifying what partners are already doing to address climate change and what projects related to the actions recommended in the plan each partner may want to support or take a leadership role on. The task force is forming climate action groups to take on the priority actions and then we'll be advocating for the policies, initiatives, and capital projects that can support those actions. Uh, we'll continue engaging the community via educational workshops and resources, and stay tuned on the Resilient Met How website for those. Uh, we'll be consulting with tribal, local, state, and federal agencies uh, to identify resources and support the implementation, and continue working with local government leaders as well. Uh, 
as well as with the, the team from the, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the National Reserve Bank of San Francisco that is helping us identify resources for implementation. They have already been working on supporting climate resiliency via the Chelan Climate Resiliency Strategy and the Okanagan Airshed Partnership as well. So here to speak about this new partnership is Tom Donnelly, Community Recovery Coordinator for FEMA. So Tom, I'll, I'll invite you to turn your video on and take it from here. Okay. Um, see if I can share my screen. Start the video. Can you all see the um, the screen? Yeah, it's it's up. It's up now. Good, great. Um, thank you very much, Joshua. I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm with uh, FEMA, Region Ten. Um, I've got. Uh, they gave me five minutes to do a presentation here, so I. I'm running, it looks like I'm running a little bit long and it's getting late, so I'll try to keep it to three minutes. Let's see if I can do that. Um, so I'm with FEMA. Um, I'm part of a small uh, a group of federal agencies, uh, FEMA, EPA, and Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. So myself, uh, uh, Craig Nolte from the Federal Reserve Bank, Vicki Salazar and Sarah Frederick from EPA have been working with uh, your community for many weeks now to help put on this workshop. And the reason we're doing this, we've, we're part of a pilot program that we've got going for the uh, for climate adaptation. And we call it a pilot uh, project because we really haven't tested it out thoroughly completely. So we hope we're doing uh, uh, some, some good for your community, but our objectives are to reach out to communities such as yourself that are doing uh, community-centric workshops and uh, having meetings and, uh, and may need some guidance on to how to get there and more importantly, what to do after you reach your objective of developing climate action, action plan in terms of implementation. So like I said, we've been working to help structure this workshop for the last uh, several weeks. Uh, and we've also been working with Okanagan County and Chelan County. We've done workshops for those two communities already. We've also got uh, plans to, to work with the Nooksack Reservation in, in Washington and Copper River Valley up in Alaska. And we're hoping that um, by putting on these workshops, we can bring better awareness and to how to be effective in reaching out to the community, but more importantly, after you decide what you're doing, and it looks like you've got a tremendous amount of uh, a, a excellent jumpstart. I'm really impressed with you, what you're doing and, and your goals and recommendations and uh, all your seven outcomes. And it's, uh, you're really well on your way. But one of the last things that Josh uh, just mentioned is next you take a look at what the resources are and what support implementation you may be able to get from people like the federal agencies. So that's why we're trying to reach out to uh, help you and see if there's anything we can do. And one of the things that, of course, we uh, were working on is trying to identify, uh, well, we come into the group, uh, in, into groups with this engagement to first do an assessment and then uh, help develop your goals and objectives. And then after that, uh, come out to the conclusion in some direction in terms of, okay, you've got a climate action plan, what do you do it? How do you implement it? What resources are going to take and, and what uh, products and deliverables can you uh, achieve from that? And that's where we come in. And EPA and FEMA are very broad, very diverse. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, talk to EPA and it's more than air quality. It's more than water quality. Uh, it, it's more than forest management. It, it's a whole bunch of things, you know, the, the diversity of their expertise and their ability to come in and help on things such as climate change. How do you define climate change? There's a lot of different uh, components to that. FEMA is the same way. I, I work with a recovery division. My uh, title is Community Planning and Capacity Building Coordinator. I spend a lot of time with communities on how to put communities together after they've had a disaster. I'm working with the um, or, uh, the state of Oregon right now and their disaster from the wildfires. After uh, 
when, when those things are done in the blue sky days, what I do is try to reach out to communities like yourself to identify ways in which you can be better prepared, be more resilient in um, undertaking uh, your activities so that the next time something happens, uh, you'll be in a better position to recover quicker, uh, have a more resilient community from the get go and just be in a much more um, uh, overall better position uh, on, across the board. So FEMA's got a lot of diversity as well, just like uh, the uh, EPA does. And while I'm in the recovery division, we've also got a mitigation division. We've also got um, uh, a resilience uh, preparedness division that goes out and works with communities and trying to uh, uh, educate them on how to be uh, better prepared for recover recovery. We've got mitigation division that is very interested in focusing on mitigation through specific projects as we did for the wildfires uh, several month months ago, several years ago rather than Okanagan, but also uh, mitigation efforts that can uh, help in, in a variety of ways through the mitigation plan, through the vulnerability assessments uh, and that sort of thing to again, try to identify projects that may need funding or uh, technical assistance through better awareness or just um, community engagement and, and support uh, for uh, bringing in subject matter experts or, or just um, a variety of professional um, education and training. You know, we've, we've been around the country a long time, been there, done that for disasters and we try to avoid them as much as possible. So that's what we'd like to see if we can bring to your community uh, and try to help out as you reach into this next phase. We're very delighted to be here to help you, uh, to support you on however we can. Uh, looking forward to seeing how we can move into the next phase of uh, looking at implementation uh, characteristics and uh, resources, uh, see what we can do to, this, to make the, a very dynamic and successful plan for you. Uh, um, that's uh, what I've got, uh, Joshua, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your support and this, this needed work, Tom. Uh, it says a lot about the, the urgency of climate change. Uh, we, we appreciate your collaboration and look forward to, to the, work, the work we have, have ahead. Um, it's, it's now time for a community panel with our presenters. So I'd like to invite all of our panelists and presenters to go ahead and, and turn your videos back on to join us for the question and answer session. We are running a little behind this evening. Um, so, but we, we want to try to get to as many of the questions as we can before wrapping up. So if you can stick with us, uh, there's a lot of great questions. Remember just to, to submit those via the, the Q&A channel. And, and Tom, when you're able, if you could unshare your screen. Thank you. Joshi, do you want me to just read some of these questions here? Actually, if you, yeah, if you have them queued up, Jasmine, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one of the first questions is regard, a couple different people asked about emissions um, the, the going back to the emissions study and had questions about agriculture and the role of agriculture in emissions. Um, the specific question is, don't cows emit methane, a strong greenhouse gas? Um, I didn't see it on the chart. I understand that methane production can be reduced up to 95% if cows eat the right seaweed and it makes them healthier too. Sounds like a good idea to add to the plan if there are measurable methane emissions in the valley. Um, Alyssa, would you like to answer that? Um, <laughs> sure. I, I guess I'll speak to the, the, um, the feed supplement, the red algae that um, I know has been on a lot of folks' radar. Um, and we, we definitely discussed including it in the plan as a possible solution, but felt like that might be a little premature since um, it's an exciting possible solution, but it's still sort of in research phase from what I understand. And there's a lot of unanswered questions and there's, 
at this point in time, there's no industry, there's no aquaculture industry that exists that is growing and cultivating and processing um, that that red seaweed. Um, so it's not it's not available to producers yet, um, and it seems like <clears throat> uh, it just. I would personally want to hear a little bit from producers about um, using that sort of supplement before putting it in a plan and, and saying that it, it works for them. So that's, that's why it's not in the plan. And just to answer the question, part of the question that was about the amount of methane from cows, we, did, we didn't actually measure agricultural emissions as part of the study, but we did look at the um, scope of what those emissions could be, and we discussed the methane emission from cows. There are very few cows in the valley. Um, and so if we were able to do that, the numbers would be really de minimis. Now, you know, globally and other places, um, methane from cows is, is identified as an issue, but in terms of the valley, it doesn't really um, sort of register that much on the scale. So um, everything we do obviously helps, but that um, is, is not going to be a huge number for, for the Met Health. Um, and I guess I want to also take the opportunity to just remind folks that the way that cattle is cattle are raised in the Met Health is different than sort of the standard statistic that's used to um, suggest that, that um, beef have a really big impact on climate. Um, I think a lot of the numbers that I've read um, presume that land is being cleared to graze cattle and that cattle are held in feedlots for many months at a time. Um, and that that's just not how um, the cow-calf operations in Okanagan County operate. So um, I think, you know, it's just, it's an, it's an important, it's important to understand sort of the regional variations of cattle production. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just not the same here in the Met How as I think those, the general statistics Great, thank you. Um, another question, um, I don't know who this is directed to, but it is related to the irrig irrigation ditches and how does covering the irrigation ditches impact our water goals? Does anyone feel uh, informed to answer that question? Anyone? Good volunteer, Sarah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna jump in. Um, it, while it was um, in some of the studies um, that were done in the past that uh, the irrigation dishes, ditches do help retime water uh, because water infiltrates a little bit slowly from them. Um, some of what I've heard from council members um, says, uh, suggests that that retiming is only by a week or two. So it doesn't make a huge difference for low summer flows like way late in August when it's, when it's getting super low. Um, so uh, there's not a huge loss of, of water infiltrating that way. And more than likely that water is still gonna be infiltrating via the use by agriculture um, or uh, yeah, when, it, when, it's, uh, when it's being used on fields and stuff like that, it's still gonna infiltrate at about the same rate. So um, that's just my take on it. It's not scientific, but just from what I've understand and uh, understood and heard from other people talking about it. Do you have another question queued up there, oh, Jasmine? Sorry, I was reading the question on mute, of course. Um, <laughs> here's the question. Shouldn't water storage concentrate on higher? Quantity is important, volume is important, but the nature of the hydrological system argues for storing more water higher in the system. Beavers can do that. What other ways can we store water higher up in the drainage to make it more available to ditches and intakes lower down? Who'd like to tackle that? Go for it, Sarah. I'll tackle it. Okay, I'm not an expert in this field, but, um, and please can't interject or Sarah, but um, my sense of that is that um, 
we're looking at two different things. One is a natural storage that the beavers can do, and we can enhance that through like the beaver program. And the other thing are man-made types of storage options. So if we're talking about higher up in the watershed, most likely we're gonna be looking at what can we do to enhance the natural processes of storage. And that may be how we treat um, the ground surface of the forest in terms of large woody debris and organic matter um, in terms of um, how then it can infiltrate into the soil column and be stored that way. Um, so that's how I would look at that um, is how we treat our um, surface um, ability of the surface to retain, retain water. Um, otherwise, then I think we might be talking about more man-made types of interventions, which um, I don't see that as a high priority, but um, again, that's a discussion to be had. Okay. And I, I was just gonna jump in on that too. I just recently had a conversation with Alexa Whipple on this and um, Kent can probably correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but uh, one of the issues for um, placing beavers in smaller scale streams or higher up in the watershed is there isn't the habitat to, uh, to support them there. And so habitat restoration in those smaller streams is something that needs to happen to make those beaver placements success successful. And so um, it's kind of a little bit like working from the uh, valley bottom up, uh, working on habitat and placing beavers as you go up, at least in particular for beavers. Um, and then the other thing I've uh, heard about is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the landscape is pretty porous and so water storage could be a challenge in some of those higher areas. Um, not to say that it couldn't be done and, and uh, definitely need some, some study and some people to look into those uh, opportunities, I think. Two quick things. One is the, the topography of the watershed. It lends itself well to water flowing down to our agricultural. We have lots of high country up above. And, and water will be accumulated there still for, for a number of years. The other thing <clears throat> is that fire is very conducive for beaver habitat. It's one of the best things we can do for beaver habitat is burn forests up high. We've actually done that pretty well here in the last few decades. And so we're, we're gaining beaver habitat up high. And so that's something that um, is going to actually enhance the ability for beavers to be established up in higher portions of the watershed. Um, great, thank you. Uh, we're, we're slowly running out of time. So I'm just, we're gonna get to just a few more questions. Um, and I, we're gonna save all these really good questions and follow up with you afterwards too, because all of these, in question, all of these questions are very important and we wanna follow up. So if, if we don't get to answer it tonight, you will definitely hear from us after the event. Um, the next question is for Mayor Sue. Um, Isabel would like to know about FireWise and uh, why TWISP is not involved in FireWise. Thanks for the question. First of all, I, I, just, I was just gonna respond by typing to save time, but I would just say that I am not aware that uh, we ever opted out of FireWise. But I can say that I do know um, specifically that there is a group that is currently working in our town to implement something very much like that in talking to neighborhoods and residents, starting with, um, I know this because my father-in-law is actually in the process of doing that with a group. So um, yeah, that is not known to me. And I actually, when I first moved here, was um, very much a part of that uh, FireWise program as well. So I don't, I don't, I didn't know it was opted out, but we are definitely making concerted effort to enhance it, if nothing else. Thank you. Um, uh, I think the next question might be a good closing question for Joshua. Um, and then we will follow up individually with, with uh, you afterwards if your question was not answered. Um, it's from Dana and she wants to know, what do you think are the key things needed going forward to coordinate successful implementation of the plan? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that question. 
I think it's it's a really complex one. I think this this speaks to just the fact that this is a community driven climate action plan, which is entirely different than you know us being a municipality like the city of Bellingham deciding to come up with a climate action plan and then implement it. And so you know basically going from this community led effort and having the participation of you know the towns and local government and agencies to help elevate. The, the recommendations, outcomes, and actions that are in this plan is, is essential. Now, of course, we, we're totally aware of, you know, how many organizations are engaged in, in the good work that, you know, a lot of examples of the actions that are in the plan are already doing, but we need to, we need to increase the, the pace and scale of that and get more resources for, for those programs, as well as for, you know, the ones we want to implement. So, you know, I think we, we have this transition where, you know, we really need to be able to, to elevate the plan and have that buy-in on, on those levels of uh, town, county, and on the state as well, so that we can, you know, we can advocate for the funding needed to, to make this transition. And yeah, I think that as far as the, the transition for the task force, it's, that's a, that's a, you know, it, it's a, it's uncharted terrain, really, you know, I think that we, we have uh, resources being developed and uh, you know, setting the, the task force up with a framework to, to form these action groups to, to move that, this plan forward. But I think it is gonna translate to, to also really needing, needing the resources to be able to do that. So it can be a sustained effort. And I think every single task member that's been in task force member that's been involved in all of these organizations after such a, you know, a dedicated effort to create this plan, everyone has every intention of not having it be one that sits on the shelf and that absolutely we need to make it as actionable as possible. So certainly the, you know, the new partnerships and collaborations that emerge out of this can, can, help, can help facilitate that. So I think, um, I think with that, um, we're, we're approaching 620 and thank you so much for all of those those engaging questions. I, I wish we had more time to to engage them as a group. And as Jasmine said, we, we will follow up for the ones that, that we weren't able to to answer this evening. Um, thank you, panelists, um, for all of your incredible work. Uh, it's fen phenomenal, especially considering all of the work you're already doing. Um, so with that, um, why don't we go ahead and, and go back to the presenter mode, please? And thanks. So first, we want to extend gratitude to all of the organizations, the tribes, agencies, businesses, and local governments involved in collaborating on this plan. Uh, next slide, please. We have, we have certainly embarked on a unique model in initiating this as a community climate action plan across so many entities and are, are trusting that this makes us stronger. Uh, one of the the guiding principles defined by the task force is that our community climate action plan builds common ground, bridging common interests and shared values through collaboration and new partnerships. So this also means that an outcome of this process is the growth of those new partnerships. Um, thank you for tonight's pre presenters. Um, we had over 17 presenters participating. Um, yeah, you, you shed incredible light on the depth that you went to in, in all of the different sectors of, of this planning process and really appreciate your, your dedicated energy to uh, making this plan uh, a reality. Okay, and next slide, please. And a special thanks to, to Blue Star Coffee for their support this evening. Uh, to Claire for her beautiful art in the Resilient Methow logo, and to Angie for drawing visual notes of the forum, which will be uh, shared on the, the Resilient Methow website. Uh, special thanks to Amy Snover and all of the foundational science she and the Climate Impacts Group at University of Washington are providing for communities across our region to guide our adaptation actions. Also, huge recognition for all the work setting up, promoting, and running tonight's forum, especially to Drew Katz and Rachel Youngberg. Your talents and capacity are truly incredible, and plus you make a really fun team to work with. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for your diving into writing this plan and all of your systems thinking, and Mark for your advising and leadership throughout this process. And gratitude to, to Jasmine and the other staff and board at Mahau Valley Citizens Council for stepping up to initiate this complex task. 
to serve our community towards a more sustainable and resilient future by addressing climate change and in a manner designed to become a community-led effort. Uh, next slide, please. So please remember to, to visit Resilient Met How where you will find the, the draft summary overview and could submit your input via the community input form there. Also, if you haven't already, uh, go fill out the community survey that Julie mentioned on the TwistWorks website to support the, the gathering of that critical information. And please fill out the post webinar survey and you can enter uh, to win a $15 gift certificate card from, from Blue Star Coffee. So we'll be posting a recording of tonight's webinar on the Resilient Met How website for people that weren't able to attend tonight's forum uh, or if folks needed to step out early. And thank you for being here for all of your good work. Um, you know, at one point we had over 160 people join this webinar. It shows the, the attention that everybody is giving this, this topic. And thank you, yeah, just for, for everything that you're doing to, to raise awareness and make this uh, community more climate resilient. As uh, they say at Climate Interactive, it's not going to be easy, it's going to be worth it. Stay safe, winter well, good night.